Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 398. Quick shout out to everybody who listened last week and sent me great updates on the research that they found about the Shamir. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out episode number 397, The Shamir Mystery, and let me know what you think. I did reach out to a couple of guys, and uh, we've got some great articles that I'm going to be able to read on the program about the Shamir, and excited, talked a little bit to some of the guys at the Rocky Mountain Mason. They're going to let me read an article from there as well, and uh, really excited, but we will be bringing all that to you just in the next couple weeks. We'll take a little bit of a break from this particular topic for this week. This is the week. Tomorrow is Monday, then Tuesday, Wednesday, then Thursday, Mid-Atlantic, Esotericon. It's going to be great. We'll be there with Joe Martinez, who has planned this event. Greg Kaminsky will be there. Lots of great people. My presentation this year is going to be probably the first time ever I've really given this particular presentation in this way. Apotheosis and quantum entanglement. And takeaways from the first part, Esoterics 101, the second part, the word. We tie all this together. And then, of course, next month is Masonic Con. South Pasadena Masonic Lodges Masonic Con 2019. This is going to be a weekend-long, fully immersive Masonic conference. They're going to bring together over half a dozen notable Masonic scholars who will be speaking on various topics geared to enlighten the listener on the far-reaching impact of Freemasonry. The keynote speakers are going to be Arturo de Hoyos. There's a festive board. Um, lots of great things going on. I'll be there doing one presentation, and then I think I'm going to be working to moderate a few of the panel discussions. They're not selling tickets at the door. This is a, a weekend-long event, so know that this pays for your meals, all of the screenings. There's going to be different screenings happening. Think Comic-Con or Wizard World or C2E2 or whatever comic book convention you've been to, a Trek convention. Think that, but on a Masonic level. And that's really the way they're going to push this out there. So tickets are 125 bucks. They have an executive pass, which is 165 Check out the website, MasonicCon.com, to figure out the differences between those. Again, no tickets at the door. They're not doing that. So you need to check out the website, MasonicCon.com. It's going to be July 12th through the 14th. And again, South Pasadena Masonic Lodge, number 290. So check that out, ASAP. This week on the program, I have a piece about the Sprig of Acacia. And we've also got some information relating to the latest issue of the California Freemason magazine, which created a huge firestorm on the internet when the issue is titled Women and Freemasonry. Now, they had some general information within the issue. Uh, among them were several interviews with uh, grandmasters of these Masonic lodges composed of Freemasons. But also, what I found interesting was a great couple pieces like femininity within Freemasonry. And we all know that the four cardinal virtues are all women, all of these kind of things. So we'll talk a little bit about that and that issue of the California Freemason as well. And we'll get into all of that right after this. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to WCYpodcast.com, you can click on direct donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on in the beginning of the program. Of course, you can make that one-time donation or you can sign up to be a monthly contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose, really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com, but also we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beer and skincare. He's been so generous 
If you head to WCYpodcast.com, click on More, then click on Banker's Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products, skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more than go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to onit.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with john t ruark it is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success so check that out on amazon you can click right to it you can get it on audible kindle or in print even on ibooks and last but not least i want to ask you to check out the great books program you'll see the banner for it on the left hand side intellectual linear progression use the promo code wcy or you can just click on that link there and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from scott hambrick about how awesome the program is so that's it i hope you guys enjoy and thank you so much for helping us out. So just a thanks to people out there who listen to our show and they don't skip out on the little kind of ad portion that we do. I do have one extra little piece there. If you go to WCYpodcast.com, hover over the word more, and then click on Franklin's Fortunes. Franklin's Fortunes is a card game put out by Brother Scott Newell who invented this wonderful game based on Benjamin Franklin's virtues, and it is a card-collecting game. Not that you go out and buy cards. Everything you need is in the box. But you gain points by pulling the cards and collecting sterling, which is like the money. It's very much like Monopoly, but not based on, I guess, corrupt business practices. Uh, It teaches a, a great set of virtues, and it's wonderful. It's not just for kids. It's for adults. And uh, it says ages 14 and up. My 10-year-old plays and my 12-year-old plays. They both love the game. And again, I've said it before. I'll say it again. If I can get a 12-year-old off of Fortnite to play a game of Franklin's Fortunes, that's a win. So check it out. If you head on over to our website, again, wcypodcast.com, hover over more, click on Franklin's Fortunes. You could read a little bit about there. Click on the link that we've got. That'll take you right over to their website. And if you use the promo code after clicking through the link, capital WCY, you'll get five bucks off your order. What's great about that is uh, you get a break, you buy from a brother, and you help support this program. So check out Franklin's Fortunes, and uh, thanks again. Now, before we get into this week's first piece, which is on the California Masons' latest issue, which was titled Women and Freemasonry. I need to preface this by saying I'm not trying to be political or anything. I just thought the article deserved some great attention because it caused such a uh, reaction online, whether that was positive or negative. But it was interesting to read the issue in its entirety to understand that it's a thing. And it was pretty interesting to read from the different female grandmasters. But inside of it were two main points that I thought were really cool. One was their senior grand warden had an executive message that was really good that I'm going to read for you. And then uh, Miss Amy Newell wrote a neat piece on the femininity of Masonic lodges or Freemasonry in general. So let's take a look at those. So first was the executive message, a universal appeal by Arthur H. Weiss, the senior grand warden of the great state of California and their grand lodge. He says, just in five paragraphs, 
Ever since the Grand Lodge of England was created in 1717, Freemasonry and its principles have been held dear by countless Masons, both male and female. Freemasonry's lessons are universally relevant, and although our fraternity adheres to Anderson's constitutions, feminine elements are a part of it, through its symbolism and through the women in our lives. Women feel the same need as men to build true and lasting friendships, to foster growth within themselves, and to have a positive impact on society. Feminine masonry has evolved over the last 300 years. In France, mixed lodges worked under the right of adoption until 1808 when the Grand Orient de France declared them unconstitutional. Revived in 1901, they slowly evolved into female-only lodges, and in 1959 adopted craft masonry ritual and formed the Grand Lodge Feminine de France. Since then, lodges formed across Central Europe and the United States. In the meantime, the right of adoption did not fade away. In 1850, the Order of the Eastern Star was created, and in 1893, a variant of mixed masonry was formed, which ultimately became the International Order of Co-Freemasonry. Three feminine lodges currently operate within California. In November 2017, the Women's Grand Lodge of California was formed, and it borrowed our public Grand Officer installation ceremony to install their Grand Master. So, as we see, women have the same desire to associate with persons of good moral character while seeking the light of truth and to have a profound impact on society. As we proceed into the 21st century, we should reflect upon the role each of us plays in forwarding the principles of our ancient craft. We may approach masonry from different perspectives, but let us work together to make our beloved fraternity and this world a brighter place. Arthur H. Weiss, Senior Grand Warden. Now, my own perspective on this is that I think this is a great message. It displays and gives acknowledgement, I suppose, to the overarching theme of how great the fraternity is, and overall that truth isn't limited to any particular group of people. And uh, so hats off to uh, Brother, I should say, Right Worshipful Brother Arthur for such a great message in this last issue. But let's check out a little bit more. So there are several parts of this magazine that have great information as it comes to kind of like well all right for the male craft mason it's a difficult idea that there are women freemasons obviously i have to understand that like i can't talk to them what do i do so part of the magazine was this area and this is in relation to California only, so this is California's Grand Lodge's rules. But I would imagine most of your Grand Lodges likely have some sort of a similar approach. Uh, but it does all depend, and you should always check with your Grand Lodge official rules on it. Now, this particular one, again, California Freemason, had the rules of engagement. So how do you proceed? Well, they say... With Freemasonry expanding to new jurisdictions, it can be tricky to remember what one can and cannot share. How does one navigate conversations? Masons in California may discuss the principles, philosophies, and purposes of Freemasonry with Masons of Rights and jurisdictions not recognized by the Grand Lodge of California. Again, Masons in California may discuss with jurisdictions and rights not recognized. California Masons may not discuss the portions of the ritual that are in cipher, nor is intervisitation permissible. So you cannot visit, you cannot sit and lodge, and you cannot discuss anything that's in your cipher book that is in code. So it says, consider these questions for a personal and meaningful conversation. Why are you a Mason and what drew you to membership? What speaks to you most as a Mason? What in yourself are you seeking to improve? What are you hoping to give back to the organization and your community? And then they have a special little portion that says, Here's what's off limits. Discussing the portion of the ritual that are in cipher and visiting tiled meetings of lodges not recognized by the Grand Lodge of California. That's it. The rules of engagement are simple, and you might find that members of other jurisdictions have an understanding of masonry that is deeper and more thoughtful than the average member of the public. In fact, you might find that there is less that you can't talk about than what you can. My perspective on this is that's absolutely the case. Uh, in my own home jurisdiction, for us in Illinois anyway, we can talk about any part of Freemasonry as long as it's not the quote-unquote secrets. So the philosophy, the things that our uh, lectures teach, those are all largely open 
Um, you know, you just can't say passwords, handshakes, grips, tokens, words, do guards, points of entrance, uh, penalties. Those things are obviously quote unquote cipher, but the remainder of it is, is open. I mean, it's just, it's not, Freemasonry doesn't own philosophy and those are largely what we study in Freemasonry. So just a, a kind of a neat thing to say. So if you meet somebody out there who is in a jurisdiction is not yours or practices a right that maybe your Grand Lodge doesn't recognize, it doesn't mean you can't talk to them or you have to treat them with disrespect. In fact, you probably have more in common than not in common. So kind of neat, whether they're female or male, or maybe that's even some other organization like uh, OTO or Golden Dawn or something like that. You can kind of take this advice and maneuver it to work for those other conversations you would have as well. There's another page in the magazine that kind of lists just the rundown of where these Masonic orders are and what they are. So if you hear the names, now I've said a few of these before on the show, so some of you may be familiar, but of course there's the Le Droit Humain International, which is a mixed order. There's the Honorable Fraternity of Ancient Freemasons, which is feminine only, based in London. There's the Grand Orient of France, which is mixed. There's the Women's Grand Lodge of France, which is feminine only. Women's Grand Lodge of California, which is feminine only. The George Washington Union Grand Lodge, which is mixed. And uh, they have lodges here in America. And there's the Women's Grand Lodge of Belgium also, which is a feminine order. Uh, They have 41 active lodges in Belgium. Pretty wild. And there's a little bit more on each of those in this issue as well. There's a a small article in here that I think we'll read, and I did mention by Amy E. Newell, Ph.D., and it's Symbols of Femininity. And she says, Femininity has always been present within the temple. Freemasonry has relied for centuries on the female relatives of members and on auxiliary groups of women to help lodges raise funds, prepare for special events, sew regalia, and assist members with learning rituals at home, even Masonic ritual includes virtues and lessons symbolized by women. The images included here demonstrate some of the ways that femininity is threaded into Masonic ritual and lessons. Now, I really suggest you head on over to the website. We'll have a link in this episode uh, so that you can see the pictures of the items we are describing. But faith, hope, and charity are among the most common Masonic symbols seen on aprons, charts, tracing boards, and other Masonic prop and engravings. Known as theological virtues and almost exclusively portrayed as women, they are introduced in the Freemasonry's Entered Apprentice degree. Keeping within the compasses was a popular cultural tenet in England and in America during the 1700s, both inside the lodge and outside. A message of self-control, this stricture was widely understood throughout society. Freemasons adopted the idea during the mid and late 1700s, This teapot, made in the 1790s in Yorkshire, England, uses non-Masonic images of a man and a woman, quote-unquote, keeping within the compasses, and demonstrates the impact that Freemasonry had on both sexes when a man was an active member. Pelicans pricking her breast to feed the chicks, one of the central symbols for the Scottish Rite's Rose Quad degrees, symbolizes maternal love and sustenance. The pelican is also a symbol of resurrection. Aurora, goddess of the dawn, is not as commonly seen in Masonic ritual as some other symbols shown here. This 1755 engraving by William Tringham, 1723 to 1770 perhaps, quote, The mysteries that here are shown are only to be to a mason known, end quote, could have been used to decorate the lodge or a member's home. Associated with light and the bringing of the dawn, and bringing the dawn, it is no wonder that she appears on a Masonic print that celebrates the fraternity's chief purpose of seeking enlightenment. Time and the Virgin Time and the Virgin teaches Masons that, quote, time, patience, and perseverance will enable them to accomplish the great object of a Mason's labor, end quote. The symbol signifies the passage of time and mourning the virgin grieves for the unfinished state of the temple. It is often credited to Jeremy Cross, author of the True Masonic Chart or Hieroglyphic Monitor. Mendocino Lodge number 179 is known for its sculpture of this symbol, carved out of a solid block of redwood by the lodge's first master, Eric Albertson, between 1865 and 1872. 
So that's all I wanted to read from this particular magazine. There's so much more. The interviews are great. The pictures that go along with it are fantastic. So check that out. Go to CaliforniaFreemason.org and uh, you're going to hover over news and click on California Freemason. But if you just go to the website, there's a link right there. You just click on that and it will open up a web interface version of the magazine. It's not like a PDF that flips pages. It's more of like a, a standalone encapsulated blog for each issue. It's pretty cool. Before we jump into the next piece for this week and the commentary that goes along with it, I would like to give you all a clue in on what we're doing next week. Next week we'll have an episode based around the Circumpunct and the St. John. It is around that time of year where lodges are doing St. John celebrations and this kind of thing. We actually just had uh, illustrious brother Christopher Hodap who runs the Freemasons for Dummies blog. He wrote that book as, as well as many other books on Freemasonry. And when he presented to us, he came out to talk about the Circumpunct and the Saints John. And we really enjoyed his awesome presentation. He incorporated so many really great elements within it and talked about almost a psychological link to practical application, etc. You'd have to check out what he had to say about it. And perhaps you may have a chance to do that uh, as... Uh, our lodge will be putting out a publication with the papers from our presenters, so you'll be able to pick that up on Amazon at some point in the future. So next week we'll have several different little articles and pieces to talk about the Saints John and the Circumpunct and kind of a, a wide variety of opinions on what that means and how it's applied. So look forward to that next week. So what I want to talk about next is the obscure idea of the sprig of acacia. Uh, it's gotten quite a bit of great publication as of late due to the wonderful writings of P.D. Newman, who, if you've ever had the chance to read any of his work, whether that's in the Knight Templar magazine or his book Alchemically Stoned, which talks about uh, dimethyltryptamine and uh, or DMT and uh, the sprig of acacia and many other plants and, and holistic things, spiritual type plants and experiences through uh, chemically induced psychological states of mind. He writes a, a great deal about this topic, but outside of like this realm of it, really the sprig of acacia is kind of an interesting symbol. Like, it almost doesn't belong, it feels Christian only, or what is the real issue with this? Or what does it really symbolize? And I'd like to focus on... Now, there's no real paper here. I'm just going to talk about, and I'll read some excerpts from two different guys, namely A.E. Waite, or Arthur Edward Waite, and uh, Albert Mackey. So first and foremost, I think it's important to understand that the texts that I'm going to read from, one, is uh, Arthur Edward Waite's A New Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, and then Mackey's Symbolism of Freemasonry. Relative to these texts, as we use them in comparison, is we should understand the dates as well. So Albert Mackey's was published in 1882. So he publishes Mackey's Symbolism of Freemasonry in 1882. And Arthur Edward Waite was born in 1857 and died 1942. And his book that I'll read from, A New Encyclopedia, was published in 1921. So what you're going to see and hear and is quite a bit of similar things going on between them. And I will say that Waite seems to copy the way Mackey breaks them down and then turns them a little bit and adds his own poetic flair to the way he describes these things. And so while Wait is newer, his is actually, in my opinion, more challenging to understand what he's saying than Mackey, who tends to write plainly. So let's check out a little bit of what each says, and we'll start off with Mackey because he was born first and he wrote this first. So it starts in chapter number 28, and it's titled The Sprig of Acacia. He says, Intimately connected with the legend of the third degree is the mythical history of the Sprig of Acacia, which we now consider. There is no symbol more interesting to the Masonic student than the Sprig of Acacia, not only on account of its own peculiar import, but also because it introduces us to an extensive and delightful field of research, that, namely, which embraces the symbolism of sacred plants. 
In all the ancient systems of religion and mysteries of initiation, there was always some one plant consecrated in the minds of the worshippers and participants by a peculiar symbolism and therefore held in extraordinary veneration as a sacred emblem. Thus the ivy was used in the mysteries of Dionysus, the myrtle in those of Ceres, and the erica in the Osirian, and the lettuce in the Adonisium. But to this subject I shall have occasion to refer more fully in the subsequent part of the present investigation. So this is the introductory paragraph of this work. Mackey then goes on in this chapter to identify several key points within what he's describing. First, he basically says there is no way that the acacia is synonymous with the acacia, where people have made this argument that you drop the A because of being lazy in your speech. So instead of saying apothecary, you would say apothecary, or prentice instead of apprentice. He asserts that that is nonsense. The acacia and the acacia are not the same thing. He also says that it's important to understand that regardless of where it all comes from, Freemasonry has its own symbolism attached to the acacia, and that's what matters, is what we say it means in Freemasonry. Forget the rest, what does it mean for Freemasonry? So Mackey says this, right? First, he defines the acacia as a symbol of immortality. He then goes on to talk briefly about how it is a symbol of innocence or purity of life. And this is because the plant itself is seen as this virtuous thing that can be uncorruptible in the plant world. And in final notes, he really says, look, overall, what this represents is the Masonic way of representing a sacred plant. He says all the rites had some sort of a secret plant, which paved the way for the system. So, for instance, he gives the account of the Egyptian mystical plant. They used the erica. And he says, quote, The Egyptians also selected the erica, or heath, as a sacred plant. The origin of the consecration of this plant presents us with a singular coincidence that will be peculiarly interesting to the Masonic student. We are informed that there was a legend in the Mysteries of Osiris, which related that Isis, when in search of the body of her murdered husband, discovered it interred at the brow of a hill, near which an erica, or heath plant, grew. And hence, after the recovery of the body and the resurrection of the god, when she established the Mysteries to commemorate her loss and her recovery, she adopted the erica as a sacred plant, in memory of its having pointed out the spot where the mangled remains of Osiris were concealed. So that's really interesting. He goes along to say that these plants really are connected with the rites of initiation, which again, they hearken back, way back, to the Osirian mysteries, or the uh, Adonisian, whatever, Eleusinian, all of these things. The mistletoe uh, for Druidism. We also had the lotus in Egypt. Believe it or not, in the Mysteries of Adonis, they used the lettuce plant. Mackey says, quote, Truly the most important and significant one in Masonic science, we have a beautiful suggestion of all the mysteries of life and death, of time and eternity, of the present and of the future. Thus read, and thus all our symbols should be read. Masonry proves something more to its disciples than the mere social society or a charitable association. It becomes a quote-unquote lamp to our feet whose spiritual light shines on the darkness of the deathbed and dissipates the gloomy shadows of the grave. So it is also this symbol that is conveying the idea, the ultimate truth, more than this idea that's commonly referenced in religious texts of a resurrection to a future life or a heaven or a hell or whatever, you know, your belief system allows. More than that, the sprig of acacia alludes to this other ultimate truth, which is not that you will live again. It's that it is a perpetual living. And so now let's take a right turn off into the wild. And let's check out what A.E. Waite said. Now, before I go further, it's probably a good idea. Some of you are like, well, why did you choose Mackie and A.E. Waite? 
Well, I chose those two because they're very different in their approach. They're very different in their language. And they probably wrote some of the most concise things on this particular symbol outside of, again, what uh, some newer people have written about it, like P.D. Newman and the like. So believe it or not, when you open A.E. Waite's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, or a new Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, rather, the first entry is the Acacia. And I'll just read what he says before he gets to breaking it out. He says, Acacia, insofar as this tree which is connected with a memorable event in Masonic legend, may be regarded a symbol of immortality. The notion may be referred to its extraordinary persistence, for Duprat says that if any of the bark be left on its branches, they will take root if planted as posts. There are several species among which the acacia vera is called, the Egyptian thorn, otherwise acacia, sayal, and produces gum arabic. It is identified with the Shatta tree and the Shatim wood of Exodus and Isaiah. It was used in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant and the altar of the tabernacle. Christian legend tells us that the crown of thorns was made of its spiked twigs, and in the curious pseudo-historical account attached of the grade of novice and knight of the St. John the Evangelist, the wood of the cross is said to have been of this tree. I do not know whence this fable derives, but perhaps on account of it, Horace Walpole calls the acacia, quote, the gentlest tree of all, end quote, following the Elizabethan dramatist who terms Christ the, quote, first true gentleman that ever breathed, end quote. The rabbinical tradition, which calls it simply a thorn bush, the red and white blossoms were regarded as sacred in Egypt, and in one of the folk tales ascribed to the 19th dynasty, the hero is represented as placing his soul for safe keeping within the petals of the topmost bloom growing in a valley of acacia. For Paracelsus, it was a healing tree. He used it with other ingredients as a plaster for wounds and apparently to stop bleeding. So here A.E. Waite then breaks out into a few different things. He talks about a sign of immortality, which is this idea that is consistent with like the evergreen because the acacia itself covers all evergreens, but not all evergreens are acacias. Then he goes into the hermetic rose, which is interesting because it is different from where Mackie goes. And then he talks about, again, a sign of innocence. So a little bit about the hermetic rose because it's different. He says, from my own point of view as a mystic, it is a figurative representation of our inward nature, like the hermetic rose itself. As that rose out of the rude mountain so issues from the nature of man of earth, the many-petaled flower petals from within, as the beautiful blossoms of the acacia are put forth successively till the branch is covered and weighed down. So from one root and stock are the powers of our interior and center manifested outwardly. As the life of the young pelican was sustained by the resources of the parent bird of the legend, so our so are our exterior forces fed from the spirit which is within. So from within is sustained the life of the outward man, and that which is interior is the larger part. Our possibilities are greater than our attainments, but there are greater attainments to come. While the mystics tell us that he who is within is older than he who is without. On such a priory, considerations, the acacia typifies that which is immortal in our nature, when planted to signify the place of rest where lay that which was perishable, it testified that the master lived, and so also that which he denoted. The plans of the unfinished temple were not wanting but hidden. The word was reserved somewhere and would be restored by time or circumstances, and after the shadowed lights of figurative resurrection, there would come the orient light, the bright and morning star heralding a resurrection in the spirit in the real and imperishable man full of grace and truth the motto to be inscribed on the acacia is therefore resurgamus nos so there you have kind of a another you can see what i mean by his poetic discourse and what you really take from that is that he makes this parallel of the acacia and how in man the greater part of you is man is inside rather than the outside a couple different looks at the acacia and how it's used. If you've got other questions about the sprig of acacia or things I didn't mention and you want to let me know about them or you want me to research further on some things and talk about them, feel free to email me anytime, wcypodcast at gmail.com. 
That's it for this week, guys. I hope you enjoyed the program. Please, if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and like and subscribe. We get a certain amount of perks and access to YouTube studios and things once we get enough likes and subscribers on our YouTube channel. So please make sure you uh, do that. Even if you're just l listening to this on uh, your podcast provider of choice, swing over to YouTube. Type in whence came you, subscribe for me, so that way we can get access to a lot of those features. Thank you again to our producers of this program. Without you, we cannot do it. You know who you are. Your names are up on the board. I will update the board shortly, so hopefully we'll be all up to date there. And last but not least, I hope to see many of you at Esotericon later this week. Until next week, stay on the level for whence came you. I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.